Hello and welcome to Connect Online. Good to have you with us today. A little bit later on I'll be sharing from the scriptures around um, our current series on integrity. We kind of began to explore last week uh, what it means to have integrity as a community. Um, and this week we'll look a little bit deeper into the intergenerational community. Uh, what does it mean to be uh, a church family, a community of faith that values every generation? And that we can hear God from one another. Um, our leadership team met this week and we are looking at opening up a building for Sunday services at the beginning of December. As at this stage, everything opens up for everybody regardless of um, status. So there's no sort of discrimination. So really looking forward to that. We don't have to wear masks. We can sing and worship our God. Um, so really looking forward to that. Uh, in the meantime, we are planning some prayer meetings. So in November, we'll be having midweek meetings in the building. Uh, our prayer will begin this week, this Wednesday, uh, uh, with a prayer walk. So we're going in pairs, praying around our community, praying for and over our local community. Vanessa is organising that. You can contact her about the best advice on how to do that. Those who are interested, I imagine, will meet in the front of the building and then we'll go off in pairs and pray in the local area. But you may be praying from your home or, or going with somebody who's local to you. Uh, you can head to the church website, go to the resource section and find the latest 5x5x5. Five by five by five. So that's our journey through the New Testament together this year and praying through that. Uh, currently we're in 1 Peter and heading towards the end of this month into John's Gospel. I love John's Gospel. So it'll be great to do that. So check out the website. We are uh, in discussions with other youth groups about when our youth goes back. So we'll let you know as soon as we possibly can. I'm meeting with some uh, church pastors this week. We've reached out to Fresh Hope to try and find out what that means. In the meantime... A big happy birthday to all of our October babies. So if uh, if you're one of the October crowd, God bless you. Have a great birthday when it comes. And um, yeah, I pray you have a great week. So as we head into the rest of our service today, Brian will lead us. He has a revelation. Christ Jesus, crucified and risen. Why don't we join together, wherever you are, and worship our King. is my revelation, Christ Jesus crucified. Salvation through repentance at the cross of which he died. Not here my absolution. Right. 
Hi Connect, um, I just want to bring you some thoughts from something that I've been challenged with lately. Um, I don't know about you, but I have found um, that the news is quite heavy. The news is quite depressing um, and yeah, sometimes I just, I don't even want to watch it because it's just, it feels a little bit too, too much. And so I've been finding myself um, just disconnecting and, and not watching the news, not um, not always keeping up to date, just briefly kind of scanning through and um, and yeah, not engaging with the news. Recently, um, I had a, a friend give me a newsletter from Every Home for Christ, um, a mission agency. And in that newsletter, there was an article about praying through the news. I saw it and it, I was challenged by it. So I thought I'd bring some of those um, ideas to you guys and see what you think. Um, because I don't think that Jesus would disengage from the news if he was here today. Um, Jesus didn't disengage from the horror, from the... Um, the sadness from, yeah, the, the horrible parts of society. He walked towards them. He um, stepped into situations that, that looked hopeless. He stepped in to care for people and to uh, to make a difference um, when he was here on earth. And I think he would do the same today. I don't think he would just walk away from the news. And so if I want to honestly become more like Jesus, then I need to find a way that um, I can step into those places, um, but step in in a way that um, I'm not carrying that heaviness. I'm not carrying the the sadness and the, um, the horribleness of the things that are reported in the news. And that's what this article was about. So there are six steps um, that I'm going to share with you today. Step number one, um, decide before you sit down and watch the news. Decide that you're going to come to the news spiritually and mentally prepared and involved. That you're actually going to pray through the news. Um, praying through the news doesn't just happen accidentally. It is something that, um, unless we're really practiced at, it's something that we actually need to make an intentional decision to do. Step number two, ask the Lord to guide you as you pray through the news. Ask him, God, what are you doing in this situation? God, what would you like to do with this situation? Listen, hear what he has to say. Three, Watch the news with God. Ask him um, to allow you to see things from his perspective. This is not easy and it um, will probably mean that at times things that probably didn't bother you or you allowed to wash over you um, will affect you, either make you angry or sad. Um, things that um, yeah might challenge you in different ways ask him, ask God to see the news from his heart four journal bring a journal to the news for me this is the most difficult thing I'm not really good at writing things um, but if you write down the insights that God gives you as you pray through the news um, then it's like a news journal. It's like God saying, um, "This look at this this hopeless situation and look what I've done with it. Look how I've turned it around. Or look um, look at the, the process. It's a really good way to actually be able to go back over and see uh, God's hand in this world. Number five, ask God if there are any actions that you need to take personally as a result of what you've seen and what you've prayed over. Sometimes that might mean donations. It might mean um, continuing to pray over a situation. It might mean writing a letter or voting differently, um, or it might mean something bigger. 
but sometimes it actually will mean God will say to you, this is not for you to continue to hold. This is something that someone else um, is already involved in, something that someone else is um, yeah, on their heart. And I've given you a different route. You take, you stand in the things that I've given for you. So ask him what it is that he wants to do in you to do in response. And number six, bring your Bible when you pray through the news. As you're praying, you might be reminded of a scripture. Um, or if you have a, a device, you can Google things that you think, that reminds me of X, Y, or Z. Um, it's, yeah, surprising when you deliberately look to pray through the news, how God's hand um, is apparent, how his scripture is applied to the world and to the news. So I hope this has been helpful for you today. It's um, not an easy thing to do. And I'm finding that as I'm trying to do it, that it's quite difficult. And like anything that you've done for the first time, um, or you're not super practiced at, there will be times where you feel like that was terrible. Um, I need to start all over again, or maybe I should dump this because it's too hard. Be encouraged that as we practice these um, disciplines, then God will make it easier and much more natural. And how much more, more value will it be um, for us as believers, for the world to be upheld in prayer as we pray through the daily news? Be blessed as you try and step out into this area, um, as I do. Thanks, Connect. Good morning, everyone. It is my privilege to share with you as we come now to a time of communion, a central part of our service. Last week, Laurie led us so well in remembering Jesus and the cross when he talked about focusing and how important it is in everyday life and especially as we think of Jesus. Today, I just want to build um, a bit on this theme. It must have been a couple of months ago now in one of our Zoom prayer times that I was reminded of an old-fashioned word that I hadn't thought of in quite a while. And that word is... Behold. It is an archaic word that is used in the Bible a massive 1,527 times, over 12 translations, although much less frequently in our modern day versions. The word behold doesn't give the sense of a quick glance or a mere look, but one of surveying, considering, contemplating, feasting one's eyes on. I was actually surprised that when I looked that one secular dictionary defined it as see with attention, behold Christ. We read in John 1 29, John the Baptist says of Jesus, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So this morning my invitation to you is to come and to behold him, to feast our eyes on him, Jesus, to linger in your thankfulness for his life so freely given for each of us. But how do we behold him? I love that as a group of believers there are many individual ways that we can approach the cross and gaze at his goodness. Maybe the way you behold him is by closing your eyes and praying. For me, if we were meeting together in our building, it, it would be by leaving my eyes open and gazing at that rugged cross that is at the centre of the stage. So today, I'll just have to remember that cross with my mind's eye as I contemplate. Or perhaps you may behold him well by immersing yourself in the song 
that will be on the screen next. It does contain that word behold and you may well be very familiar with it and at least the first verse. So my prayer is that it will help us to linger in our time of thankfulness. So take whatever you have at hand in your own time while the music is playing and let's behold our Saviour, Jesus, who has taken away our sin and given us a hope and a future. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace.
Good morning. Thanks for joining us at Connect Online again this week. Good to have you with us. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. For those who are part of our uh, church community, great to connect with you again. Last week, uh, we looked at integrity being all of life. So we've been working our way through um, the topic of integrity this uh, last period of time. Um, talking about integrity being uh, wholeness, a sense of who God created all of us to be, each of us to be. And then last week we looked at um, integrity not just impacting us personally, but as a community, as a church, as a family of faith, that we see church as an extended family network. Um, Deb Baker, who's our intergenerational team leader, uh, kind of talks about church being family. It's messy, like family is. Um, And so we began to kind of look at some of the principles around that. You know, in the last hundred years or so, uh, we've shifted our thinking around church and and broken it down like the education system has done in terms of ages and stages of life, a demographic breakdown rather than uh, as an extended family. I went to the park the other day um, and there was a bunch of people from our church family all sat together. There were some families there's a couple of uh, ladies there, and and they weren't sat in rows with one of the dads at the front. They were sat. Kids were playing on blankets, and uh, dads were sat, and so were the mums. And mums were talking to each other, and dads were talking to each other, and there were a couple of other friends who were connected and talk. It was organic. It wasn't uh, just organised the way we've organised church. And as part of our restoration movement, we want to restore our biblical roots. We want to get back to the foundation. Spiritual formation is not limited by age and stage of life. The Holy Spirit comes on all flesh. And so the three points from last week were that the word is key, that we need to learn it personally, that we need to apply it in our lives. And then every one of us has a responsibility to teach it across generations. That integrity is about all of life. Uh, We don't go to church. Our church services are not the whole sum of church, which has been really apparent in this season where we've not been able to go. We're looking forward to coming back soon. But going to church is not the right language. It's about being the church. We're the church whether we're scattered or when we're gathered. Um, And uh, thirdly, we said last week, family is the primary environment for discipleship. And ask the question, who are your family? This week's message continues that. It's around the whole notion of intergenerational church. And we take that so seriously that we are kind of moving Deb Baker's role to be responsible to direct us in that um, theme of intergenerational church because we believe it's something that the body of Christ has lost. We've lost our way and we need to restore that. And so we're picking up this week from where last week ended with this notion. And so our first point would be that generational discipleship begins at home and not just with mum and dad and kids, but grandparents, aunts and uncles, extended family networks. Because other godly influences is vital. So the where we were last week in Deuteronomy 6, the message version of that says, write the commands that I've given you on your hearts. It's not about this kind of physical way of doing things. It's a spiritual thing. And write them on your hearts. Get them inside of you. This is what Moses is saying to God's people. Get the word into you. And then get them inside your children. Talk about them wherever you are, whether you're sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning until you go to bed at night. I love the way uh, Eugene Peterson phrases some things. And so 
this kind of concept that speaking out the word of God, training up, discipling people begins in a family environment. But other godly influence is vital and that's where the church is so profoundly important because we have a network of people around us. When I saw three families out in the park together sitting around blankets, there were a couple of um, women there who are just a godly influence from generation to generation. It was beautiful. Um, and so in uh, Timothy, so in 2 Timothy, Paul is um, writing to Timothy and he says, uh, Timothy, I thank God for you. And shouldn't we feel that way about everybody we have connection with, particularly those of the household of God, the family of faith? And he goes on to say, I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. And so there's this generational influence in Timothy who becomes just a great um, disciple of Paul as he imitates Jesus. Um, Fuller Seminary, one of the great Bible colleges in America, um, did research with hundreds, thousands of teenagers just trying to figure out what was the connection that kept them, you know, kept some of them in faith while others drifted. And their discovery was it was this network of spiritual influence, a web of relationships across their church family. It wasn't just their parents, but it could be grandparents or um, other people that they looked up to. And that influenced them. And this is the work of research. You know, if we want to build a church that goes on for generations, then we have to build a church that's made of generations. Um, if we don't invest in the next generation to come, if we don't pass the baton on well, the church is only a generation away from extinction. And so, well, this is talking about, you know, in a sense, grandmother, mother and Timothy, it's not as simple as just going in one direction. Uh, if you go back to the previous chapter, Paul talking to Timothy earlier, um, is talking to, to, to Timothy as a pastor and a teacher. And he says, teach these things and invest, sorry, teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. And so the things that Paul has taught Timothy about the gospel, teach these things. And he goes on to say, don't let anyone think less of you because you're young. So Timothy's a very young man in their culture. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, your love, your faith and your purity. And Eugene Peterson says your integrity. You know, we're talking about integrity here. Um, and so there's this whole sense that even though he's a young man, Paul is encouraging him, teach others. He goes on in chapter 5 and says, uh, to Timothy, don't speak harshly to an older man. Appeal to him as respectfully as you would your own father. So there's this speaking into the lives of more mature aged people. Be respectful. Um, treat older women as you would your mother. Treat younger women with all purity as you would your sisters. Uh, it, it's this family metaphor that continues, but it, it's not about the older speak into the lives of the younger. It, it moves across the generations. And Timothy is a young man, has learned from Paul. He's got the word in him. He's learned it from his mum. He's learned it from his grandma. So speak it into the life of the people around him and be encouraged to do that. You know, we, we think back on the old covenant, King David. David was the young one of the family who... Uh, was anointed to be the king. And there's a sense, you know, as we mature in age, sometimes we get more conservative, we get less courageous. And David could not be doubted for his courage, um, fighting off bears and lions, which trained him uh, for fighting Goliath later. And then he was creative. So whenever the king was tormented, he got uh, David to play an instrument and David's playing soothed his troubled soul. You know, the kids that we see, they're, they're active. <laughs> they're, 
They're curious. They make friends. When we were kids, we were active and curious, made friends much more easily. We would try new things. You know, talking to Di in our preschool, kids learn through play. And we've lost that sometimes as adults. So we can learn from younger people. Young people can inspire the inner child that still exists in us. You know, Jesus in Matthew 18, he says to his followers, you, you need to become like children. And to me, that's, you know, it's, it's we need to recover that childlike, not childishness, childlikeness. It's the same thing talking about wearing kingdom glasses. We actually need to see without the cynicism and the limitations that we allow this this life, this earth to place upon us. In Mark chapter 10, uh, the, a bunch of kids are, are coming towards Jesus and his followers try to stop him and he says, let the children come because we can learn. Um, so, you know, in growing up, our, our kids become like us. But really, we should also become like them. Childlike, not childish, but that that pure faith, not tainted with uh, cynicism. You know, there's a sense for me that God wants his family back. This imposition of the world and the, the, the realm of the earth, this, this realm, not the kingdom of God, the kingdom of this realm, um, it taints us, disturbs us, limits us. And God wants his family back. And that comes with a kind of cross-generational input. Deb shared with me um, some thoughts from a devotional uh, that she was reading in her Bible as we were going through the 5 by 5 by 5 that we've been going through for the last few months, since, well, since the start of the year. Um, and, and it's really profoundly interesting about how particularly women in her uh, devotional impact each other across the generations. And if you're a bloke, this, just translate it. It could be the same thing for men across the generations. So I'm just going to get Deb to share this and then we'll come back. Hey, Church. I um, just wanted to read you a devotional that I um, have in my Bible that is based on Titus 2. And we're reading towards the end of September in our 5x5x5. Five by five by five. Um, it's just interesting about uh, relationships between older and younger women. So here I go. Here's what I do, I said. I planted my feet firmly in the hallway outside the sanctuary and drew myself up a little taller in the wedge-heeled sandals I was wearing. I smoothed the front of my sundress and prepared to make my case. My friend stood across from me. She peered at me over her spectacles and leaned a bit on her walker. She wore polyester pants, white leather sneakers with Velcro closures a sweatshirt with applique designs on the front and her signature perfume and fluffy white hairstyle. As always, she yielded the floor to me. I've known her for more than a decade. She was in her 80s when we first met. Last year, she celebrated her 95th birthday. I, I am half her age. I didn't anticipate it when we first met at church, but slowly over the years, she and I have forged a deeply meaningful friendship. I don't hesitate to tell people that she is one of my very best friends at church. A few years before I met her, I noticed most of the women in my life were usually 10 to 20 years younger than me. In my writing groups, on social media, my face-to-face -face relationships at work and in the community, I seemed to be drawn to and attract women who were younger than me. At first I reasoned I must be young at heart, but over time I began to worry why I wasn't forming significant relationships Friendships with women my own age as much as I was with women who were a few steps behind me. I had been married for quite some time while my friends were still single, dating or newlyweds. I had children in high school, whereas they were hosting baby showers. I was having hot flashes while they were weaning and potty training. Like many women who have come before me and those who will follow me, I was fretting over my friendships. Despite the fact that I had beautifully enriching friendships with wonderful group of women, I found something to worry about. Of course, the worry began as a simple recognition that my friends and I were in different seasons of life. But as often is the case with a small seed of doubt, that recognition soon morphed into a sense of concern, which finally blossomed into the conviction that I had no sense hanging out with those young women. 
Well, if they were just being nice to me because they felt sorry for me, what if they can't figure out how to get rid of me? Thankfully, before my doubt, concern and worry got the best of me, I stumbled upon the wise invitation in Titus 2. It says, Older women are to teach what is good. The words of that passage landed on me like gentle rain, washing away my doubts and giving me a new perspective on the friendships in my life. Reading the words of Titus 2, I began to realise the great gift I have been given and I embraced with even more fervour the willingness of these young women to grant me access to their lives and their friendship. Plus, they even let me babysit their kids. I taught them what I knew about love and life, dating and singleness, marriage and parenting. I called it old school, they called it wise. They taught me about sleep schedules and social media, shea butter and pour over decaf. They called it no big deal, I called it life-saving. Fast forward a few years and I found myself living in a new town, attending a different church, surrounded by women who were ahead of me by a season or two. They were women of deep faith who embraced life with enthusiasm equal to their faith. They rode rapids, made guest appearances on news outlets as economic experts, wrote textbooks, taught college classes and rode in hot air balloons. I was in awe and fascinated by what awaited me in my upcoming seasons of life. These women folded me into their world and they have nurtured my own faith by patiently and joyfully walking with me through the various moments of everyday life. They have taught me to trust myself and they have shared their wisdom to help me do that. They love me well, they don't get, let me get away with any nonsense. I can trust them to have my back and to hope the best for me in all things. And so that one Sunday morning, I stood in front of my 90 something friend and said, this is what I do. I don't remember exactly why we were talking about how to deal with people who get on our nerves, but I said to her, I have this list I put people on. I was proud of myself. She didn't flinch, so I continued, convinced I was dropping a great bit of wisdom on her. She didn't flinch. Oh, sorry. So this had been my practice for years. I put people on the list when they bug me, I continued, then I wait for them to work themselves off that list. I waited for her to applaud me. Instead, she straightened herself up, looked down her nose at me and said in quite a loud voice, well, that's just wrong. Then she chuckled a bit, waving me off along with my nonsense. And just like that, I stood corrected. I'm a better person because of these cross-generational friendships with women. The women ahead of me inspire and encourage me the years to come will be rich and full of life. The women, women ahead of me hold me to high standards and keep my feet on solid ground. The women behind me give me hope for the future as well, and I am blessed to be able to share a little bit of what they call freedom, what they call wisdom from time to time. We need each other from generation to generation. We are so much better together. I've definitely found that to be true for myself. There are um, many women in the church, um, both younger and older than me, that I am good friends with, um, who I rely on for things. So I encourage you to uh, widen your circles of friendships across the ages as well. I'm thankful to Deb for sharing that, uh, the story of the, the relationships that this woman had around her. Um, she had a deeply meaningful relationship, a friendship, with a woman twice her age and tells a story about being corrected. As I heard it, um, is the story of making lists or putting people in, you know, keeping them at arm's length, is that just her story? Or are some of the rest of us guilty of that too? She talks from Titus chapter 2, just after um, 1 and 2 Timothy in, in your, your Bible. Paul talking to Titus, like Timothy, and saying, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. So he's not just saying to, to Titus, you need to be up the front being the leader, but you need to live the lifestyle that you're uh, teaching from and reflects that wholesome lifestyle, integrity. Teach the older men to exercise self-control, goes on to say they must have sound faith, be filled with love and patience. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honours God. So he's saying to Titus, as a young man, you've got responsibility to be the teacher here. Uh, these older women must train the younger women. And so that's what... Um, Deb was sharing from this relationship that happens across the church that we need to be learning from one another 
So the old men are learning from Titus and the older women are, he says to Titus, you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. Both sides, everyone is learning together. We all have capacity to learn from one another. I love that um, statement Deb made in the devotional thing. Friends don't let you get away with nonsense. But they've got your back. And there's this, they, they want you to be the best you you can be. So they'll challenge you when you're uh, stepping outside of that. Uh, Proverbs 27, there's a great verse in there. It says, the wounds of a friend can be trusted. Uh, but the enemy multiplies kisses. There's a sense that flattery doesn't help us because it's not honest. It's not truthful. It doesn't give us any capacity for growth. Uh, in that devotional that we need each other, generation to generation, we're better together. And so for you today, will you choose beyond the safe and the comfortable? Next week we'll be looking at... Um, our choices have consequences. And it's something that should be apparent to us through this whole COVID season. The choices we make have consequences, not just for us, but for others and for the community around us. What choices will we make this week? You know, if you're joining us for the first time, um, Jesus made choices that impact your life, impact every human life. He paid the price to set you free and me. And perhaps this is news to you. And I'd love to fill you in on more of the story. Uh, you can contact us. Just flick us an email, office at connectchurch.org.au Or if you want to look up our website, connectchurch.org.au There'll be information there and uh, contact phone numbers that you can get in touch with us. We'd love to fill you in on more of that story. And help you to make that connection for yourself. In closing today, uh, as we prepare for next week, let me just pray. Would you bow your heads and let's uh, pray together. Well, God, we just come before you. Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And we pray in this season when we're exploring integrity that you would help to make us whole. Help us to be fully the people that you created us to be. Help us to be whole personally, but also as a community, as a family of faith, as a church. God, help us to make the choice to engage in influence across the generations, to hear from those who are younger and those who are older, to hear your voice and to, to apply it to our own lives, but also to teach it to others. Help us, God. To be the kind of people who can trust the wounds of a friend. God, not easily offended. Um, not the kind of people who, who withdraw, but who build trusting relationships where we allow people to speak into our lives. Help us to choose not to take offence, but to choose instead to grow. And I pray, God, that we would choose you this week. I pray anyone who's watching and maybe doesn't yet have a relationship with you, God, that this week they would choose you. Help us to be an influence uh, in your kingdom, in Jesus' name. Amen. So what will you choose this week? Pray that you have a great week uh, and can join us next week as we look into some of the consequences that choice brings with it. Uh, have a great week and be blessed in Jesus' name.